Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Welcome to a new video. I got with me Mort Mazibas. Assalamu alaikum Mort. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullah. And I got with me Khalil from Kalamology Podcast. Assalamu alaikum Khalil. Assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So in this video, we're going to be talking about uh, a survey published by ex-Muslims of North America. The survey basically um, uh, mentions some interesting statistics on ex-Muslims, where they're from, what they were doing before they became ex-Muslims, and what they did after they became ex-Muslims, and a lot, a lot of interesting statistics, uh, very laughable statistics sometimes, about their apostasy and what they went through. So, um, yeah, let's begin. There you go. Yeah, so this is a PDF uh, downloaded from their website. So, um, Apostate Report, Leaving Islam in North America. All right. So um, if you don't know, Ex-Muslims of North America uh, is an organization um, of ex-Muslims living in uh, the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, so uh, Ex-Muslims of North America has conducted a first-of-a-kind survey on the experiences of American and Canadian apostates from Islam. All right. So... Um, there is an introduction, methods, and sample, how they sample the respondents, and uh, who are the apostates, where they're from, uh, uh, their gender, and stuff like that. And then uh, some statistics about what they were doing before apostasy. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to talk about uh, most of it, inshallah. So who are the authors? Uh, the authors are listed as Sarah Haidar. Uh, she is uh, one of the heads at ex Muslims of North America. Um, also, Mohammed Said, he's also uh, one of the heads of North, uh, the ex-Muslims of North America. Uh, these two, uh, I don't know who they are. But anyway, um, the thing is that Sarah Haida doesn't have a background in, you know, statistics or data sampling or data science or anything like that. Neither does Mohammed Said. So what happened was, and this is very confusing to me, uh, and I want you guys to comment as well. So they, um, they say that the survey was conducted online by researcher, researchers at George Mason University, contracted by ex-Muslims of North America. Participants were selected based on blah, 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 blah. The thing is, why would, there, why would they list themselves as authors when they hired a university to do it for them? I don't get this, to be honest with you. Uh, what do you guys think? Mort. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what her qualifications are in terms of even um, un, you know, conducting this kind of research, but we do know they outsourced it. But what I'm curious about is, um, did they take the, you know, did, did they use the university to conduct uh, the actual polling? And then they took the data and then with, you know, the raw unaggregated data and then use that to con come to their own conclusions. Um, if that is the case, that that would be problematic because they're not data scientists. They don't understand how, how these things work, right? Um, you can't just take uh, random data and then have your own conclusions from it. I mean, you could, but it's not accurate. And um, so, I, I mean, <laughs> we'd like to know, like, what are your qualifications in doing this in the first place? Again, you know, I mean, there, there are yeah. a whole lot of problems behind this. So on Wikipedia's, uh, on, on Sarah Haider's Wikipedia page, it says, Sarah Haider is a Pakistani writer, uh, Pakistani, uh, Pakistani American writer, public speaker, and political activist. She created the advocacy group, Ex-Muslims of North America. And it doesn't list any um, credentials. level, yeah, credentials or levels of education or... We don't even know if she got uh, Yeah. We, we, we don't know. Same goes for Muhammad Said. It says that he's a Pakistani American writer, speaker, and political activist. He created the Ex Muslims of North America advocacy group in 2013. Um, I don't see any credentials, uh, any um, you know, education levels. I, I don't see anything that qu that will qualify him uh, to do a survey like this. It's almost <laughs> that yeah, his whole career is being an ex Muslim. That's it. That's that, that's all that I can find on his Wikipedia page. Well, um, one interesting yeah. thing to note is that um, he, as a child, he had a love for the sciences, mostly astronomy, and he was a big fan of Star Wars and Star Trek. <laughs> there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Star Trek and Star Wars were an influencing. Very, fan. yeah, very interesting credentials. Yeah. <laughs> May the force be with you. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right on, bro. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> also, there, there's something uh, interesting as well. Um, 
it says those uh, who consented were sent the questionnaire over 550 respondents answered the survey the thing is um, what, that I find problematic is that they're not mentioning the exact number uh, of participants or respondents to their to their questionnaire I'm not sure why because I would you know I, I expected that they're gonna for example say a thousand people responded but only 550 for example uh, filled the survey uh, in its entirety and the numbers that you see here in the survey are based on these 550 people because they completed the survey uh, because you know as anyone knows who works in surveys and statistics there uh, there is always missing data that you have to deal with so we yeah, either you have to mention the people that failed to to finish the uh the research for example 20 dropped out uh 30 did yeah. this and then we end up with this like i mean to have yeah exactly exactly so you have to you have to deal with missing data so you can drop the missing data altogether or you can fill it you using for example statistics like you know uh putting the average in you know in, in the place of missing data or uh, there are a lot of ways to deal with missing data none of this is mentioned here all we have is an unexact number 500 over 550 which could mean anything right there right? are nuances and, and the problem is that you could have like the, it, it doesn't account like, for example let's say they mailed out 5,000 surveys and you know maybe you know 4,500 thought this is complete BS so when I fill it out right I mean <laughs> yeah. it's an indication of how seriously people took you right and how you were able to actually get data um so it's important to know that so just saying over 550 what does that mean i mean there's no half numbers here there's no half people i mean it's not 50, 551 and a half right or 15 and a half no it's either a round number or not you what do you mean exactly. over 551? what do you mean by this yep so uh it says that um it says here that participants were selected based on affiliation with ex Muslims of North America support communities and invited to take the survey via email. So they, they were not they, they, they were not targeting your average ex Muslim. Okay, they were targeting people who already allied with their movement, some way or another. So the, they're either affiliates with ex Muslims of North America or one of its um, support communities. You, you get my point so right. we already know that the people responding to this survey or, or this questionnaire are are, are, are biased mm -hmm. because why why would an ex why would your average ex-muslim or why why would an ex-muslim ally with an organization who speaks about or speaks against islam because they're already biased so the data is is not that good to be honest with you yeah i mean it it, it, it is a certain subset of ex-muslims because there are ex-muslims who don't have anything to say about Islam anyway. They just didn't feel like becoming it wasn't anything particular within Islam that they didn't they just for yeah. whatever reason don't want to be a Muslim. And when you take a group like the um North American ex Muslims Council and you, you limit it to that um group of people, uh the problem is the problem is that these are some of the most vile people that talk about Islam. Right? They will never have anything positive to say everything they say comes out of pure hatred and the problem with that is i don't mind critiquing i don't mind people that critique islam or investigate islam the problem is that they they're known liars they've made lies about islam so there is a doubt on their credibility so how do we know the answers they're giving and we're talking about people like sarah Haider, we're talking about arman nababi we're talking about um, abdullah samir abdullah gondo these are the people that continually spew anti-Muslim rhetoric and uh, just lies about Islam on YouTube all day long. And these are among the likes that have filled out this survey. Um, so how do we know what they're saying is actually true? I mean, because one guy would say, I was a devout Muslim. I mean, you know, with all due respect, some of them are, are come from Shia liberal backgrounds. I, I, you can't be a devout Muslim to me. I mean, how, how devout were you as a Shiite? I mean, I, I, I mean, again, these, these are subjective terms. And naturally, the one who is in, uh, you know, part of the ex-Muslim council, who's vehemently opposed to Islam, is going to say, hey, I practice everything. I was a righteous practicing Muslim, and it didn't make sense to me. You know, I mean, right. it's, so how, how do we determine that? And right. that's very problematic in the beginning. Yeah, we're going to see this reflected in the comments that they included in the survey. So they, they sampled some of the comments uh, from the ex-Muslims who responded to the, their questionnaire. And the comments are hilarious. I, I, I promise you that. So um, about, the, uh, uh, about what you said, uh, Mort. So, for example, Sarah Haider herself, the head of the organization, uh, 
she says that she became ex Muslim when she was 16 and she comes from a Shia background. So the head of the organization itself is a Shia who apostatized when she was 16. Right? 16 it's years like, old, man. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Six years old. I mean, my question is to you is name one fiqh book you've read. Name, what is the definition of aqidah? What do you know about Islam? What have you done? What have you, what studies, what books have you read? What do you know about Islam? I mean, even in even from a Shia perspective, not even talking about, you know, uh, the ridiculous acts of, you know, carrying weapons, knives, and slicing yourself and having blood and having this, you know, you know, th this customs that they do. That if I was there, probably I would I would have left that stuff to begin with. I wouldn't want to come near yeah. the whole idea. So there are so many other uh, points that need to be mentioned in this research in detailed manner for the public or for the reader to understand the background of these people. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing, as Brother Moore was saying earlier, uh, these people, they're literally, their job right now, I mean, they put in their Twitter account and their portfolio as ex-Muslim. It's almost become like a thing now. Like, I mean, you would think someone left, if you got, if you broke up with your fiance or something, you just move on, man, move on, you know, get some <laughs> Go out with your friends, do your thing, you know, find someone else, move on. That's it. You're not going to have, you're not going to be attached to your ex and keeping her every time you go meet somebody. Oh, by the way, yeah, um, uh, Sabrina's ex. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Exactly. Your profile. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, someone cleverly said that, you know, your ex will never have anything good to say about you anyways. Right. So we don't expect you to say anything good anyways. Right. So the the idea here is this, that they did Wait, that. More, more sounds like you speak from our experience, bro. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. You know, but they did uh, they did document in the uh, in in the uh, re research that how many were Sunni, how many were Shia. But again, the point is that at 16 years old, yeah, I mean, like, what do you know about the world? You couldn't. I mean, you, you hardly you got done wiping your butt. You know what I mean? And you're 16 years old. I could doubt if you could even make ghusl properly. I mean, at, at 16 years old, right? And you're talking <laughs> about now, you know, the deepness of Islam and you know what it stands for, and you read all these things. I mean, at that point, I don't think in reality a person could discern what is culture and what is religion, right? At that point, right? So if you go to, a, in her case, a Shia gathering, you see people stabbing each other with knives and beating themselves and crawling in dirt. I mean, what? I, of course I would leave that. I mean, why would I stay and watch this? Yeah, that would put anyone off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's the difference between that and Hinduism? Nothing. I mean, it's the same thing. And, and that's what I, you know, if you, especially if you're brought up around these kinds of things. And even, to be fair, even among some of the uh, Sunni uh, sects or people who are among them, they have some of my very strange practices, right? And right, so right. whether it be black magic, whether it be, um, you know, just, you know, the, the status of certain uh, shuyukh among them, whatever it may be, but that can put somebody off and that's cultural. How does a 16 year old kid know the dif difference between culture and religion? Did they, did, they, did they account for that? Like what level of, of Islamic knowledge, fundamental knowledge did you have before you apostated? Was that ever a question? I mean, they, they said, oh, were you religious or not? What does that even mean, were you religious? I mean, going to the Salat al Jumma is religious or what? I mean, what, I mean. What even putting the hijab on? Like, yeah. And, and we're, we're, sometimes you put on because it's cultural. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. This is very problematic. And they, they even say in the survey that um, they asked them whether or not they were religious compared to their family members so if their family member members were for example it's like let's say uh his father was a liberal secular muslim and he for example prayed juma that would be religious based on <laughs> you, get, you get my point it depends on yeah what your parents were you know, i mean i'll give you a, a real life story there was a brother here who uh before he became practicing um you know he was involved in a very very bad life he was born muslim but involved in a bad life and basically his idea of being religious was staying away from drugs that was his religion like when he decided to, when he wow. moved away from drugs he's like oh i'm religious now like i i haven't i, I don't do anything bad like i don't fornicate i don't do drugs Right. So basically, I mean, obviously that changed. That was a catalyst for change later on. But in that moment, he thought he was being religious. So just because you show up at Salat al Jama or you go to Eid wearing your best outfit and you're, you're standing in front of the girls doesn't mean you're religious. I mean, it doesn't really mean anything, dude. <laughs> I don't know what your, your, qualify, or what your criteria is, essentially. And they don't account for that. That's the problem. When you have these kinds of surveys in such a vast, you know, uh, 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 sphere of, uh, of people, the nuances are important. That's all Zero. it comes down to. Uh, yeah. So l l let's say who, um, who uh, l let's mention who, um, who's represented in, in, in this survey. So the population of ex-Muslims captured in this survey is not representative of the ex-Muslim population as a whole. 
especially outside of North America, since the survey questioned only people living in the United States and Canada, right? That's the thing. Uh, also, um, the, the ex-Muslims represented here are prim primarily uh, a population of immigrants originating from South Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Okay, so most of the people uh, surveyed here are immigrants uh, originating from South Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa. All right, so um, for example, uh, reverts, American reverts, or Canadian reverts, or apostatized are not represented here. Okay, so now you, you begin to have an idea who we're dealing with here. Are the data uh, necessary consequences of the fact that? Respondents were sampled from ex-Muslim uh, ex -Muslims of North American communities. These were communities based uh, in uh, major American cities where like-minded ex-Muslims. Uh, so here, here you go. And they, they, they didn't sample all the ex-Muslims. They targeted ex-Muslims who are like-minded. So let's read here. As a result, our population is explicitly non-theistic largely atheists, agnostics, rarely deists, okay? So, for example, you won't find an ex-Muslim, now Christian, surveyed here, all right? Because the, 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 these people exist, right? Someone who left Islam and became a Christian. These people are not, uh, are not re represented here. Uh, for example, uh, ex-Muslims who are now deists, they're not represented uh, as well. So, so, so let, let's yeah. talk about that, why that's important. Because naturally, people who move from one, these are people who have a, an issue with spirituality in the first place. Meaning that it's, it, it's understandable. I mean, although it's very rare of people moving from, from maybe Islam to another religion, but it's also very common to see the other way around. I mean, Muslims, I mean, Christians coming to Islam. But naturally, people who have an animosity towards the idea of organized religion in the first place because of some trauma in the past or some kind of cultural thing, they're naturally going to have an, an implied bias, meaning that they're going to say, hey, look, all you guys are just trying to impress me. You guys are trying to, you know, all you guys are the same type of people. All your religions are the same. All you guys are oppressed women. You oppress minorities, blah, blah. You, know, you get the rhetoric, right? So while, and, and this is what we say when, we say that the devils are in the details because they're not going to put this stuff out under each chart that they put out now. Every time they use this research, they're going to throw a chart on the on the screen and they're not going to preface it with these small details saying, and hey, we only took people who left religion completely. Not and they're gonna they're gonna use the lump term ex-Muslims. Well, ex-Muslims are not only atheists and agnostic, they're also Christians. There's maybe people who are into Hinduism, well, whatever it may be, or people who um are just uh you know, they are um essentially people who are believers in just one God, maybe. I've seen people who come across and they say, I still I still believe in God, but I don't have any organized religion. And they have very positive things to say about Islam or other religions, but they just don't believe in organized religion and they don't account for these people. So that, that, that is part of the problem. In the future, I guarantee you'll see people like Arman Nawabi and people like this using this as a report on North American ex-Muslims or Muslims in North America. The problem is that they're only representing a certain demographic of them. Yeah, like-minded ex-Muslims. So what about you, Khalil? You want to add anything to that? No, I'm actually thinking about what you said. That's a, that's a great point, Akhi, what you mentioned. Because now these things are out, right? And they can be used later as some sort of um, definite, you know, uh, numbers and actually reflect the reality when we know now as we're analyzing that it, it really doesn't. Yeah, it's not reflective of the, of, of, of some, it, it is not an accurate cross section by any means. No. <laughs> and, and that's the problem, right? And, the, and that's why I think that they knew that, and I think they're doing this intentionally to cover their base so that when they do put this out, they can right. say, Oh, we actually did mention all the stuff. If you go read the research, right? But the problem is, you're just going to be using infographics. You're not. This is not labeled in your or titled in, in the fine print of your infographics, right? If you look in the in the further on in the in, in the report, it's simply just bars and charts, right? <laughs> With no qualifying information, and that's by design. They will be using this in the future, hundred percent. You know, you know, do you yeah. know what the problem with that is? They're saying that people who are less immersed in the, in the faith. Or, uh, or culturally immersed, right? But here's the funny part. If you recall, if the li listeners recall, early on you mentioned a guy named Muhammad Sayyid, and look at his bio. It says that, um, it, <laughs> he says that uh, he came from a well-educated background as both of his parents had PhDs and describes him his upbringing as relatively quote-unquote liberal, from which his mother was particularly open-minded. 
that's another code for, hey, they, they didn't practice Islam. Right. So even in the demographics they're mentioning, he doesn't qualify as the majority in, in the demographics, right? And because he's talking about, he said that here that people who are liberal or less inclined to be culturally you know, immersed in the faith are probably not going to re respond to this article. So, I mean, to the survey. So right now we can very clearly see that his bias is there because he's saying most people like me are not going to write these things or, or join my group. So, so I mean, again, you, you're catching this right from the get-go that they are, there are uh, definitely um, motivations for them to fill this out because they're, they're trying to portray Islam in a certain way. I just noticed that, by the way. But yeah, go ahead, continue. Um, yeah, so uh, let's, uh, let's move on to the next page. So who are the apostates? So uh, what do they look like? So um, Eddie, yeah, 61% of them were males and 37% of them were female. So they're, they're saying the gr uh, greater prevalence of men lines up with the general non-religious population. According to findings from Pew Research Center, uh, Pew Research Center's uh, religious landscape uh, study, American unaffiliated and atheists especially skew male at similar rates. So we don't find, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't find a disproportionate percentage of female apostates because if what they're saying is true about you know Islam oppressing women and stuff we should you know see yeah I higher than average uh female why apostates. is there more men why is it more men exactly for example? And, and they're saying these percentages are in line with uh pure research uh study about uh you know why it's atheism, hard to yeah because these are the men that don't want to take care of their wives, get married, be dutiful, right? They just want to go and have fun. So Islam makes them be responsible men, and they want to go out and just do have fun, have a party. I mean, let's just be honest, right? Most of the stuff these guys talk about, oh, when I was a Muslim, ex a Muslim, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. I had to do this. I had, like, you know, I mean, what was the guy, Abdullah Samir? He was talking about crying about his divorce, right? Oh, I had, I divorced her. I couldn't go back to her. Islam made it difficult for me. So basically, he left Islam for his own desire. He wanted to play with the religion. And so Islam sets guides for uh, parameters for Muslims and, and, and for men and for women. And generally, we know that, and just as, as an example, I'm mentioning Abdullah Samir, but I mean, let's just be honest, there's certain institutions within Islam that are meant to protect women, and marriage is one of those things. Otherwise, without marriage, men mm -hmm. would have no rights upon women. I mean, we could just essentially impregnate a woman and not be worried about the children, not worry about idda, not worry about mahram, not worry about taking permission from the father, meaning bringing family in. You would have a, a, a chaotic society. And so a lot of the, maybe that's why a lot of these men are leaving Islam, because it's in their, 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 their worldly desire, interest to leave Islam. They don't have any accountability. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're you're surrounded by all sorts of desire, desires, and like but Islam is telling you to restrict it. If I might emphasize on what you said, brother yeah. Habib, earlier about the, the, the disproportion between men and women, uh, like like brother Habib said earlier, that's a good point. If as what they say that Islam oppressed women, and there is this, this this crazy picture that they draw about now that the women are in the free world or West, whatever you want to call it, right, where they can do whatever. They want, how come we don't see a higher um, percentage of women? Apostatizing. If that was true, the narrative you would expect to have more. Yeah, women. in wow. fact, we, we we see the opposite. For example, in in uh, in the UK, seventy five percent of reverts to Islam are women. Seventy five percent. These are these are European women, like uh, women. Th th these are British women. Yeah, and like, educated, etc. Et exactly, and and the, 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 they're saying they embrace Islam after years of research, right? So it's not like, oh, she had a Muslim boyfriend and this is why she became Muslim. No. It's not, many of them were like liberal, that. even feminists and all in the past. If you like watch their videos and talk to them, many of them had these ideas, did adopt liberalism, uh, feminism, all these things. And then after the research, they've, they've reverted to Islam. It is true, Akhi. So now age. So this is very important. As you can see, um, most, of, most of them are, are, are pretty young. So from 18 to 22, that, uh, we have 10%. 10% of them were from 18 to 22, 37% of them were from 23 to 28, 28% uh, of them were 29 to 34. So these people are mostly in their 20s and early 30s, right? If that's the case, um, then I, you know, I'm, I'm remembering what you said earlier. How, how would a 16 year old know <laughs> why Islam is fault? It's like- Another yeah. thing, 23 to 28. Now, let's just say between 23 and 25, let's say that's 
okay? And just a number there. I mean, I'm probably median. And then so 18 to 22, that's 10%. So 25%, a quarter off the bat. Here's the interesting thing. Since they are believers in science, quote unquote, they would also tell you that the human mind isn't mature until somebody is 25. So what do, what do these people here in that 50, in that 25% bracket, are they truly able to rationalize one of the probably one of the most biggest imp important decisions in their life? I mean, like, like salvation or religion or thinking about these things. Most likely, like most people in their category in that in that age group, they're not really thinking about religion. They're not really thinking about these things very no. deeply. Right. And th these are things that usually I'm not saying there are not religious people. Um, they may be religious in practice, but in general, like when you're pondering these these things about life, right? Especially in an age now when we're surrounded by YouTube and in Netflix and Instagram and Twitter, you're not really made to think about these things. So what what really does a twenty anyone under twenty five, you know, how are they thinking about religion? Most of their religion is being you know, either told to them culturally if they're not you know born in a household that you know encourages them, and uh, they're not really living a very you know. Um, uh, I guess Islam conscious life in that sense. No, yeah, I agree 100 percent. Okay, 100 percent. Yeah, I've mean, yeah, well, been there in that age. Let's be honest here. 21, 22, 23 years old. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for me, like, I mean, whatever I have learned from my parents is probably what I would, I would apply some of it, a percentage of it, because of what I think I wasn't into like any research and wanted to know. I didn't even know what right. the word aqidah meant. Bro, like let's be honest, 22 years old, aqidah, fiqh, sunnah, these things, like I don't know the details of this. I don't even know. All I knew at the time was whatever I knew when I was a kid, and I'll try to practice as much as I could. And some, most of the time you fail. And like you said, you're busy, your mind is busy with social media. Were well, you brought things. up in the US? Yeah, when I was a teenager. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I'm just saying, like, you know, you're busy surviving, you're busy going to school, get education. The way things are set up now is just, you know, even more so now when I, I mean, I, I just hit 40 this year. So, I mean, I was a kid in the 80s, man, and, and, and life is different. I mean, nowadays you have kids that are even more impacted by, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, right? They're not thinking about religion. And the religion they do get is probably going to be tad bits, um, you know, from social media. It's not actually studying these things. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt. And, and and the kids around them, the, the normal some kids around them, like th they're doing crazy stuff right now. So like an immigrant Muslim who just got to the US, right, is now exposed to all these craziness. Obviously, that's going to affect them, especially if they don't know their religion well. Right, they're going to see kids their age doing whatever they're doing. Th that's attractive to a young, a young guy yeah, or a young girl. Absolutely. So absolutely. That, yeah. So, I mean, people, uh, teenagers, and people in their early twenties are affected back where you know there's a majority of Muslim people. For instance, if you go to the Middle East, you know, it's a subcontinent. Kids there in their twenties, you know, with all due respect, you know, if, if you're watching this and you're in your twenties, we're not picking on you. We're all been there, but just generally speaking. Even in those countries where you hear Adhan and all these things, and you're still not really into, like, you, you don't really, I'm talking about the majority here, not the exceptions of you guys that are watching this. But you, you don't you don't have that skill to even get in there and into comparative religions, about your own religion, about understanding the, the actually meaning of Tawheed. But I, within a full book of one of the scholars, you, you just don't do these things. You're constantly busy with high school, uh, college entrance. Now your new life in college. Your, your whole hem, as we say, a whole issue here is to, like, Guarantee career. You trying to figure out whether you want to go to pharmacy school, med school. They want to go to engineering. I don't know. There's so much going on. Not to mention also the physiological and biological and hormonal changes that occur at the level you know of your physiology as you're changing and, and that now you're looking at the opposite sex. You're completely busy with these things. Let's be honest here. You don't have enough time to actually give it its help, its right, and actually study the religion. These are just facts. No doubt. No doubt. One hundred percent. So. If you check the sexual orientation, so as you can see, 81% of them were heterosexual, uh, 13 bisexual, 3 homosexual, and 3 other, right? Which means, which means that Wait. almost 20% of them, 20% of them were not, were not heterosexual. I want to know what the hell other is. Like, if you're so, you, for example, for example, you got uh, pansexual, you got asexual. asexuals. No, but how do you know it's not, wait, wait, how do you know it's not uh, like animal sex people, like bestiality? How do you know it's oh, not bestiality? Oh, dear God. I'm yeah. saying, huh? hey, 
But I'm just saying, I mean, because you yeah, have right, okay, so, so, right. necrophilia, who knows what they're talking about? Three, that's a that's a pretty out of 550 people, three hundred three percent of those 500. That, that's crazy. Maybe we can draw some stats from that. Meaning, three percent of every ex Muslim is a, is a weird sexual deviant, like made they might be in the graveyard doing weird things at nighttime with dead bodies. We don't know. I mean, if you want to play that game, like they're skewing data now, we can totally skew the data back and be like. Three percent right, right. guys are sexual deviants and weirdos who stay away from our children. Okay, <laughs> check this out. Check this out. Our respondents were almost four times more likely than the average North American to identify as LGBTQ. Oh wow. Okay, four times, <laughs> four times more likely. So that means bro, basically that, one, one bro, five, that's four yeah. times more than average North American. We're, like the place for this, you know. <laughs> yeah exactly so just to give you an idea that means out of every 550 so on that's about 17 people that are that are a sexual deviant and then about another 17 that are um you know um 17 people that are homosexual um so that means you right now you only you already have like 30 or 42 people that are pretty much you know weirdos yeah. I, mean, I mean really i mean in some sense so, but here's the reality here here's the interesting thing though now this is not just to you know you know um attack homosexual same sex same sex attracted people but what i'm going to say is this there's no doubt that people who do deal with this uh, same sex attraction in a society like america or other places in the world where it's not the norm for the most part um you're going to have psychological issues meaning there's what they call trauma meaning that you're not going to be accepted you can be depressed there's anxiety so how do you know that that dealing with that is not one of the reasons that made you know um, it contributed to them just kind of not thinking clearly, right? When people become depressed, when they become, you know, we always hear this, right? Oh, so I'm sorry I did something. I just wasn't in my mind. I wasn't thinking. Yes. Clearly. I had a lot going on. And, and mind you, keep in mind, to almost a quarter of them are under the age of 25 where their minds are not completely developed yet. So how does that affect a, a growing mind, right? Where they don't know what they're saying. Um, they don't know what, really how to deal with things, right? And uh, especially with an onslaught from media and social media about these things, they're, they're, uh, it's, un, it's a lack of clarity. So how do we know that this doesn't affect them in a way that made them just say, you know what? I don't understand anything. I'm giving it all up. How do we know? You know, in this age group, Achi, in this age group, honestly, the way I look at it, it's just like if someone left their home, like left their, their mom and dad's home because you're sick of it. They're just sick of, for example, hearing stuff from their parents. Oh, don't do this. Don't stay late. Don't do that. And they just like, it's like, you know what? I'm leaving. I'm getting my own apartment. And you hear this a lot. You hear this a lot. It's very common. College, that's it. I got to get my own thing. It's almost like a thing. This is, for me, I see it no different than that. You know, you, just, you might hear some restrictions that your little mind has not uh, developed enough to accept it, to analyze it, to understand the hikmah, wisdom behind it. And then you're like, you know what? I don't want it. I, I just want to leave. Leave my house, get my own thing. This is exactly how I see people live religion. Not because they have done research and they know what they're talking about. It's because it's an usually an emotional reaction. Beautiful example. It's exactly like that. I mean, they, they really don't understand what's happening and they don't know that the, they think the grass is green on the other side. As a matter of fact, I'll even tell you, um, there's an ex-Muslim that I was speaking to who's now, I think, on the way back to Islam, but he was very involved with this ex-Muslim <laughs> council like inside in their inner Twitter circles and they prey on young women and young children. They absolutely do. They actually even begin to um, threaten them that they, they will begin to expose their pictures and whatever other weird things they're doing in private. So this idea that, oh, when you go into uh, this ex-Muslim you know, congregation, you're, you're, you're welcome with open arms no matter what your sexuality is. No, that's not the case. There are perverts in these groups that will exploit you and use you as well too. Exactly. So, you're not seeing any of this, right? There's no, uh, and 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 the funny part is that as what what, um, I, I guess they're trying to equate something here, which is funny because and and it's funny why that highlighted sexual orientation because in an age now where sexual orientation is a big deal, right? Everyone's making a big deal. Are you transphobic? Are you homophobic? Right? There is no guarantee. The ex-Muslim community is not monolithic. There are quote unquote transphobic and homophobic people among ex-Muslims as well too. So how are you trying to, why is this statistic important? I mean, what are they determining? Because they're certainly not leaving Islam just for that because m many other places, even non-religious circles have very homophobic and transphobic people too. It's not just religious people. So it's a bunch of nonsense. It's a crackpot ar ar argument, argument, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. And by the way, the same pattern of preying on young women, that's present in neo-atheists. For example, there was an incident with Richard Dawkins and um, the neo-atheists were trying to ally with Richard Dawkins rather than 
uh, be fair uh, with the um, with the victim. Also, you got uh, Lawrence Krauss. Uh, his university, I think, filed a complaint or maybe a lawsuit against him because he. Uh, I think he maybe uh, I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but it, it involved a student, a female student. I think he um, maybe sexually assaulted her or something. Same thing with that's the uh, same guy who thinks incest is okay. By the way, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you know what? You have to uh, listen, Khalil. At least you have to, uh, someone who comes and says that. I will respect him. I'll tell you why. Because at least he's being consistent in his argument. If they believe morality is subjective, a lot of these people they will try to dance, you know, dance around the issue. If you are an atheist, your morality is ent entirely subjective, right? Whereas a Muslim, a theist, believes his morality is objective. And all these people play around and they say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You know, oh, genetics and blah, blah, blah. They make all these excuses, you know, societal norms and blah, blah, blah. But at least he's out and open and saying, this is how disgusting we are. You know, we, we will allow you to have sex with your sister and your mother and your father and even a dead family. They don't care. There's no limit to their morality, right? So at least he's exposing and he's honest enough to say, yes, we are ugly simple creatures who have nothing to do but just you know act like sexual deviants or maybe even do things which are immoral for example um i don't know uh um you know anything with animals or even for example sam harris's argument with the the end justifies the means where we can kill uh, millions of people as long as our inherent values reach them because the end justifies the means and this is what and this is why I appreciate people like him when they say that, yes, we believe in, be, uh, you know, or, or incestuous relationships. Why? Because there's nothing inherently morally wrong with it in their, according to their morality. So I would say I, I wish more of them spoke like that because when, when, a, when a person like me hears that, we're like, this is exactly why I believe in my religion because you guys are completely off the rails here. Alhamdulillah, we have yeah. Islam. Alhamdulillah. And, and, and these same people Alhamdulillah. would... I, I heard I heard this so many times from ex-Muslims. They would say, oh, you need a religion to tell you not to sleep with your mom. And then they would say, there is nothing wrong with incest. Okay, make up your mind. Make up your mind, dude. Like, So do you need a constitution that. to tell you that you don't have to murder? We still have it there. Why is it there? I mean, what, what exactly. you, mean? you should but, murder, but we still have laws against murder. Yeah, I mean, why do but, you believe the constitution then? But it, it's, it's, it's really strange when, when these same people say, you know, incest is wrong. Okay, uh, sorry, incest is okay. But then they would say, you need a religion to, to tell you that, uh, you know, not to sleep with your mom. Okay, so, yeah, you are saying that it's okay. So, yeah, I do need a religion to tell me that don't sleep with your mom. Because, like, there are weirdos like you who say that incest is okay. Exactly. Right? And like you said, bro, uh, uh, like you said, well, if uh, okay, why, why is it legally, legally, uh, oh, so, sorry, why is it illegal, right? In all constitutions, not to kill. Why? I do like most people don't do it. Yeah. They don't need like they, they know they, they don't need. Just in case uh, we have weirdos gonna be like, oh well, uh, it's not legal. Like, it's not in the constitution. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, after all, we all have the goal. You don't need to have religion to have the golden rule, as they call it, the golden rule. You know, they'll hurt everybody else. The reality is there's just bad people, right? And so for bad people, we need to punish them. Likewise, we need to have a very strict punishment for people who are, are deviants like you, who want to encourage people. Because Islam, this may be a side topic, but Islam does not account just for Muslims. It accounts for Muslims even uh, having non-Muslims live among them. So why is this important? Let me give you as a side topic why this is important. Because many many of these um, jahil ex-atheists don't know this, but when they conquered Persia, um, among some Persian communities, it was it was it was um, common for the royalty to have sex with with their with their family members to keep the bloodline pure. And so, and Islam does not force religion on people. So when they lived in their own areas, we knew that Islamically that those people, if they're if they're advocating for other people to do that, right, we could say it's haram. This is the legal the penal code in Islam. So we have this, right? While you can do it in your own areas, it's fine. But if you're advocating to the state and for Muslims around us and other people that they should go have sex with their mothers, sorry, we're going to stop you because our penal code, our sharia says this is not allowed. So this is what happens. It's not for us alone. It's for you other, the other people around us who are under our, our control as well too, which could be deviant atheists like yourself. Simple. Definitely. Definitely. So let's uh, move to the next page. Where are they from? So, 32% of them are not immigrants, and 68% uh, of them are immigrants. All right, <laughs> and um, let's see uh, parents' birthplaces. Okay, so percentage 
uh, whose father slash mother was born in South Asia, uh, so almost like 50%, uh, Middle East and Africa, uh, 34. Yeah, so they're mostly from South Asia and Middle East and North Africa. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is now, I know this may not be true, but immediately when I see immigrants at 60, what, 8%, I immediately think about that guy that didn't fit in. And he's like, you know, uh, you know, I think, oh, I just want to blend in. Uh, I can't be a Muslim here, right? My inferiority complex. Yeah. Is, I got to be like a white guy. I, I can't fit in. And he just wants I to think, be. Exactly. I, think, I think you just said it earlier, or Brother Habib, who said that uh, I don't want to be called a terrorist or something. Yeah, yeah. So that was a comment, actually, um, that one of them left in the commentary. Maybe we'll get to that later on. But yeah, one of them was like, I just didn't want to be called a terrorist. I'm like, really, bro? Like, and, and, yeah, and, and there are variations of that. So, for example, you, 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 I'm sure I'm sure that uh, a lot of Muslims are being questioned. Are you homophobic? Do you believe in this? Do you condone this? Uh, do, you, do you support ISIS? And I mean, these type of questions are intimidating, especially to an immigrant who just got here. Right. So maybe Rob not even a Muslim. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, maybe, but you know, you know the funny thing though is that even if you say you're not a Muslim, <laughs> and your name is like Abdullah, yeah, they're gonna think you're a Muslim. I mean, you're not gonna get away from it. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, one of the one of the uh, arguments that some of these people say who are ex-Muslims, they will tell you that the reason why we're so interested in Islam is because when you know when bleep hits the fan, uh, my name is Middle Eastern, they're gonna come for me too. So they're really worried about themselves, right? But so they understand that no matter even to, while trying to fit in, they're still they're still going to lump you with the Muslims. So what are you yeah. doing? But this is why they have this sickness, man. So such a good point, man. That's why they have this this illness where they literally have to walk. Like I'm just gonna take an example: a brown dude named Abdullah, right? Like you know, whether you're checking the uh, whatever you are, you always feel like you have to justify. Oh. A conversation you're ducking on ducking on grabbing coffee and someone's talking to you about i don't know about uh, the elections you're like yeah by the way i'm ex-muslim so when i used to be muslim i was like, so when i used to be muslim it's like <laughs> almost it's like it's like a, a broken record you have to put it in your facebook profile in your twitter profile you have to mention it on subway you know when you're grabbing a sandwich you have to, it's just like a sickness man like that's because you know that's like you said you're attached no matter what and subhanallah you just mind boggling Think it is. It. it is. It's a very strange thing, a phenomenon that is unique to only ex-Muslims. You never really find people saying, "I'm an ex-Jew. I'm an ex-Christian. I'm an ex-Hindu. I'm an ex." I mean, maybe oh, bro, nobody talks about these things, man. Yeah, it's weird. And it's literally the only um, ex that I mean of anything in religion that you can actually monetize, right? Oh, I'm an ex-Muslim. Why? Oh, I was an ex-Jihadi. I was an ex, uh, you know, a Salafi guy. I was an ex this one. Blah blah. Look, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, I was. Yeah, I was married. I was married to uh, an uncle al an Al Qaeda uh, yeah. terrorist. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. Like Yasmin Muhammad yeah. said. Or my yeah. mother's daughter, my mother's cousin's first uncle's nephew, who's part yeah. of something. Yeah, yeah, he he was the leader of the Islamic Jihad somewhere, right? I mean, this is what, or you know, I was in Lebanon in my school, and the, the Hezbollah came in and killed all my teachers, and I, I somehow jumped out of the window and survived. Yeah, Allah, like, mashallah, I mean, you were the only one who could with the brains, no one else had the brains to jump out the window. I mean, yeah, you, you need to be in the Marines, bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, you need to save Lebanon at least and bring it out. Why'd you come here, bring it out from whatever it is right now? But the point is, being is that. Like you have people even like Walid Shubat who who claim that you know what oh I was ex PLO and I was gonna bomb and nobody knows him his own family doesn't even know him in Palestine like what do you tell he never did any of this stuff right I mean so the the problem is I need this identity to say that look, was he the guy giving lectures against Islam in uh, in, yeah. the, in the in the U S government and stuff like that yeah and, and to local so, law enforcement but his son Theodore Shubat is like a jihadi Christian like he wants to like go and like have a you know, he's a dominionist, which means that he wants to actually bring Jesus back by force. Like he wants to have <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, modern crusades. day crusades. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, he went to Spain. He went to he went to he, he refused to go to South Spain. He went to North Spain. Like I'm on blessed holy land because the martyrs stood here, the Christian crusaders and blah. blah. Uh, no Andalus. You don't want to the Andalus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But anyways, my point is is that these individuals we don't 
like a lot of them have a story and narrative because it's very easy to come out and say, I'm an ex-Muslim, ex-Jihadi, ex-fundamentalist, blah, 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 blah. And immediately you get attention. You welcome them into this. Uh, a lot of people love this limelight, right? That, oh, I'm, I'm now going to get attention. Maybe not be the money, but hey, I have someone now, people who will pay attention to me. They're going to invite me. You know, they're going to bring me to dinners. They're going to, you know, and I'm going to find a way into the into this culture where they're going to finally accept me because um, if even if I just left Islam and said there's nothing wrong with it, they're going to see me as an outsider. They feel like they have nothing interesting to contribute to a conversation besides to contribute to the, the, the stereotypes that they have about their people. It's funny because you'll ask them, is your father a terrorist? Is your mother a terrorist? Are they, are they also, I mean, they'll say, no, my parents are good people. You know, but I'm thinking about Muslims. Yeah, but aren't they Muslims? I mean, aren't you, are your cousins terrorists? Are they, are they jahil? Are they, are your cousins being honor killed or blah, blah, blah? You ask them these things and they'll, they'll always say no. But when it comes to the general population, they will say this in front of every single Islamophobe in order to get, you know, an extra free dinner meal. I mean, it's horrible. Yeah. Right, right. Um, SubhanAllah. Um, let's move to the next page. So apostate, uh, apostates education and outlook. So 70% um, have PhDs, 22% uh, have master's degrees, 43% um, have bachelor's degrees, right? And uh, so, yeah, so we can say that, um, let's see, 43 plus 22 plus 17, that's uh, about maybe 80% of them are well-educated. Um, yeah. So uh, do you guys have anything to do, uh, anything to say about this? I don't know whether, whether after finishing their doctorate, you know, then um, became more TED or is this something now? Like let's say they, they became more TED at 17, and then eventually got their PhD and now they include in research. Now, we don't know the things. Like, what was the progression yeah. out there? Did, did they leave during the doctorate or did, did they leave when they were in some college, you know, and then they just count them now? Eventually became, yeah. Right, exactly. And the other thing is, too, is that what is their PhD and what is their bachelor's in? Like, yeah. what is it, if it's going to be marine I'm, psychology, I'm sorry, dude, you're an idiot for doing that major, anyways, right? You know what I mean? Like, it depends on how educated you are. Like, what, I mean, it's very easy, let's be honest, to get a degree these days. You can just stay in college long enough and you can get a liberal arts degree in pretty much anything, right? So, I don't, I don't know yeah. what they're trying to prove here. Are you trying to say, oh, look at all these smart people? Uh, that it doesn't mean anything, really. These, yeah. these numbers don't mean anything, really. By the way, by the way. bring you the other side also. Uh, with PhDs and, and whatever Muslims, you want, uh, and they're still theists and all. Muslims in North America do uh, hold, uh, you know, very high degrees, very high educational degrees. I yeah, think actually, they're... women in in America, like the, the highest group of women, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, minorities is Muslim women. Yeah, they're very. Uh, there's a higher percentage of Muslim women in the U.S. having advanced degrees than uh, American men. Yeah. All people. Yeah, but, and, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Just what, right. what, what's interesting, look on the right side. It says, this besides immigration may be the most noteworthy demographic characteristic of our population. Why is it noteworthy? Why is it noteworthy? What, what Here, here's the thing. This? Here's what I think. Here's what I think. They do have a section about what they did before Islam, right? I'm not sure why they didn't specify if they obtained these degrees before or after. Because they do have a section, you know, detailed about this so they could have added like a small subsection about you know uh whether or not they obtained the, these degrees before or after they became ex-muslim right but but now this becomes like a little bit vague we don't know these if they if they became ex-muslim and that somehow uh motivated them to you know uh explore the world and you know uh even to add to get educated even to add to their credibility now because now you're recruited to this cult of ex-Muslim, whatever, and now you don't have any credentials, as we as we've seen a couple people there. They literally have nothing in, the, in their in their portfolio. Exactly. Right? They, they have, now they have they have a, the organizations don't have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think they're trying to use this to frame a narrative that look, yeah. ex-Muslims are intelligent people. The, the less educated you are, the more likely you are to be religious. And the more educated you are, the less likely you are to be religious. Let's be honest. That's what they're trying to paint here as a figure. But again, um, we don't know when you became an ex-Muslim. You could have been one in high school. We don't know. As someone said earlier, there was 16 years old, ex Sarah Hyder. <laughs> you didn't even know how to drive yet by the time you became an ex-Muslim. But hey, but then let's say you get your master's. Now you're considered to be in the, in the master's category of an ex-Muslim, right? Someone who has a master's as and is an ex-Muslim. 
So again, as the brother mentioned, we don't know like what the demographics are here, but also more importantly, is they're trying to shape the argument that, um, and this is why we need to know what kinds of degrees they're getting, like because um, they're trying to shape the argument that but uh, people who get degrees and who get highly educated are more likely to leave Islam compared to the ones who don't. And that may not necessarily, you know, be true in terms of, you know, when we look at certain sciences, right? We know that many, there are many Muslims who are in the scientific field and engineering and they, and they contribute to these fields immensely and they remain Muslim and devout Muslims. So, I mean, what, and this is what I'm, what I'm talking about when I say that, you know, raw unaggregated data can be presented in any form and made it look like to be, you know, you can, you can paint the narrative you want to when you leave out the nuances and you don't provide context behind it. So I think this is what they're trying to do. They're trying yep. to frame this argument that at the, at, at, at these uh, surface level that, Oh, look, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to leave yeah. this. I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of how they use the education thing. So uh, you guys know, um, uh, what's her name? Enfidel noodle. I call, Ka I call her Kafir spaghetti. <laughs> uh, her, her name is, is is her name on Twitter is um, Infidel Noble. So she um, made a, like small video, uh, and she's saying uh, sh she's basically listing all the th nice things that she did after she became an ex-Muslim. And one of the things that she said is that when I became ex-Muslim, uh, I obtained a master's degree and a uh, and a bachelor's degree, right? What? Yeah. So what, what, and, what's, and, what, and, what's the bottom What's the what So here's the thing. Mean? What is that? Here's the thing. I, I, I have no idea, but here's the crazy part. She became ex-Muslim, I think, in 2018 or 2019, and the video came out in 2020, last year. How were you I mean, one able year to do all this, mashallah, in one year? <laughs> well, I can, I can show you people that became religious. They've always been Muslim, but they got more into religion, and because of that, they end up, you know, uh, again, their PhD, MD, JD, whatever, got married, you know, bought first house, second house, started a business. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. So, how, uh, yeah. yes, and, and the thing is, I, I tweeted about this, and I confronted her, and she she wasn't able to respond. She didn't respond. She she, she didn't know what to say. I don't think she's uh, posting that. I don't even know who she is. I don't think she's posting it because she wants to get an answer and reflect upon it, and then you know be genuine and objective and actually analyze what you have to say. They're they're already part of this agenda, part of this group. Like the brother mentioned earlier, that their guide towards this. They're literally their job is to be anti. Uh, Islamic and provoke Islamophobia. That's what that's what they do. That's what mm -hmm. it is. They're not some group that neutral and just happen to be a bunch of engineers and doctors and this. They're like, you know what? We wanted to actually realize this and we present an argument. We want an argument back and let's analyze it in a nice objective manner. No, they, this is an agenda. Akhi. They're being sponsored. They're they're literally their goal is to promote this and increase Islamophobia. It's just obvious. Right. No, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, there, there's a shadow of a doubt behind that. And what's also interesting is that when you when when you look at what they're trying to say, for example, um, you just give an example of one woman. There was another woman whom uh, Ali Dawa had um, responded to, and she basically said, um, <laughs> you know, when I left Islam, I was able to find true love. <laughs> what does that even mean? Yani, I mean, my parents have been married for 50 years. Alhamdulillah, they're in love with each other every day. Like, wh what do you mean? You, only you can have love when you when you leave Islam? Like, oh, this is ridiculous, man. Well, like, it's yeah. not even, I mean, any academic, like, you don't have to be an academic, Akhi. any person with logic. What are you talking about? Are you and saying you know that only when you leave Islam, you find true love? Mm. Is that the argument you're making? Like, and, and the thing I want to... Like, I, I, if they can get anything, if they're watching this video, if you can get anything from this video, understand something. Before you make an argument, think about it and say, hmm, can a Muslim make a counter argument to me regarding this? Like, <laughs> what would be the common sense argument, right? Are you saying now, like, if you said that to me and I came to you and said, are you saying you can only find love if you don't have a religion? And obviously the answer would be no. We know throughout history, <laughs> some of the most romantic novels in history are religious people, people who profess religion, the ones that you guys dream about and make movies about, right? So the point being here is that they're not thinking, either one of two things is happening here. Either they're, they're not thinking properly, like they don't have the ability to critically think about these points, or number two, they're intentionally making these statements to misguide people and to make it look like that, oh, you know, um, look at me, I'm so happy now that I've left Islam, right? They're kind of painting, painting a narrative and trying to lure other people in by saying, look how happy my life is after Islam. Exactly, definitely, definitely. Because in, 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 uh, in these videos, 
uh, like the one uh, Infinite Lumu put up put out. It was actually posted by ex-Muslims of North America, so they are behind this narrative as well. Uh, so, if, so for example, she said, when I became ex-Muslim, I was able to get a dog, and the dog is li licking me all over, and I love the dog's najas. Wait, Hanabi, uh, was that so, the same person we did a video about? Yeah, I think I think we did a video about uh, yeah, these her, video snippets that they put out. Yeah, and so, the one that says, uh, I always want to check this out, bro. She's one of them said. This is one of the heads of these, these nonsense groups. Mariam Namazi, right? She said, I've always wanted to walk naked in the gay parade. And now that I've left Islam, I actually did it for the first time. And, and the way she expressed it was the, the weirdest, creepiest thing ever. Uh, now I, I was able to walk half naked, you know, in the gay parade. And it felt so <laughs> good. And she's 60. She, she's in her 60s, bro. Exactly. Okay, I, I was like, man, but I'm like, are you serious? You really just presented an argument that... Your reason was to walk naked in a gay parade, and somehow, and by saying that, like to gain, you know, the LGBTQ community. Like, see, I, I, it's just, it's just ridiculous, man. Like, the like, argument. What, like, I, I'm just trying to think, like, what is the ben what, what is empowering about walking around naked with a bunch of sodomites? Like, what, what does that do for you? I mean, regardless if there were sodomites or not, like, if. She just walking naked, just that part. Yeah. What does that do for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, what, what does walking naked? How does that empower you? I don't know, Akhi. You know what that reminds me? As a mother, like forget about religion, Akhi. Just as a mother, as a role model for your son and daughter that, that are 17 in high school and 19 start of the college, you know, freshman. What role model do you really play for you being walking half naked and being caught on camera with your, excuse me, you know, naked out there exposed? I mean, this is, I mean, I don't know, Akhi. You know, stop for like me of is caveman. This is caveman attitude. Their regressive behavior. Cavemen no. are naked, but naked. <laughs> this is what they did. This is what they did. And I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah. Just you know what the funny thing though is, real quickly, is that the irony behind all of this is that you know it, it's almost like. You know, I mean, imagine if I did something like this. You know how you said, oh, there's a dog here. And I, can, mm, I can kiss this dog, all the saliva all over me. I love this nudges, right? Imagine me if I just make a video with like four wives. And, oh, look at me. I, Alhamdulillah, I was able to get four wives when I got married and I became Muslim. Alhamdulillah, look at me. Mm, you know, I mean, I, I could do the same thing. It's so stupid. Like, what, what a dumb tit for tat argument. Is that really the reason why you left Islam? Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> for a dog. Can you have a, a freaking dog? You know what I mean? That's the reason why we left Islam for a dog. Yeah, I and she was able to get a boyfriend as well and travel no. the world with her yeah. boyfriend. Oh, oh mashallah, yeah. travel the world with her boyfriend. <laughs> her Romeo, her Fabio. I mean, imagine this stuff is nonsense. You've been reading too many romance novels, lady. That's, that's the, that is the problem, right? I mean, but anyways, the point being is this. You're going to find silly and silly excuses upon silly excuses. None of these things are genuinely uh theological arguments they're usually emotional arguments about my family didn't let me do this my husband didn't let me do this i did, felt like i couldn't do this as a muslim or as a muslima i felt like i had to do this or my my morality was what was not in line with with what i was feeling inside like all these everything is emotional and and i'll be honest like we don't live a life we don't create morality we don't create laws based on emotions if we did that we would be a, a nation of chaos we'd be a, a people of chaos Imagine if we all just passed legislation in the world and made everything okay based on emotions. How would the world look like? Nobody would want to live into it. We'd run away from each other. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So let's uh, move to the next page. Uh, what did they study? So 25% um, of them studied natural sciences. 24% uh, of them studied social sciences. 16% computer science. 13% engineering. Uh, then business, humanities, and uh, and other political and social views. Uh, firmly progressive, thirty-two percent. Lean progressive, thirty-five uh, percent. So that's like almost seventy uh, percent, I think. Yeah, I was like sixty-eight, maybe. Um, center, uh, centrist, twenty-eight. Uh, lean conservative, five. Firmly conservative. 1%. So that's like 6% conservative. 6% of them, of these ex-Muslims surveyed, were conservative. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So let's let's see if that's uh, before or after. So that percentage uh, who describe their political views and social views. Okay, so it doesn't say if that's before or after. Um, but yeah, 
Um, yeah, is, is that after so, Islam? Is that before? Is that, I mean, how, how I do we? Know. What is it, I mean, what a poorly done study. And you know, the funny part is that you would think that the this is like the first report they come out with. It's going to be like groundbreaking. They're going to set a pattern. They're going to be academic because they love science. Or they're going to tell us, they're going to teach the Muslims how to be academic and how to really present reports and data, right? Because they all oftentimes complain about the Pew research and all this stuff, right? Oh, we're not accurately represented. This whole thought, is full of nonsense and trash. Like it doesn't, it's unqualified. Very <laughs> yep. poor. Very it, poor. Exactly. And I'll, I'll tell you something that I noticed. Uh, it's very important for them to say whether these views were held before or after they apostatized because a lot of these uh, people, they do jump from, you know, uh, from, from um, extreme to extreme, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Apostate Prophet, he used to support a terrorist organization in Turkey, okay? And then, and then he jumped from that to being the most, like, vile ex-Muslim that you can find. So from extreme to extreme. You get my point? A lot of also uh, ex-ISIS members, they became ex-Muslims. The, the, these people jump from extreme to extreme. So that's why it's important for them to say, did, were they conservatives before or after? Because you guys have a pattern of being extreme, whether to the left to, or to the right. So sadly, this is not uh, stated here. You know, I'm so glad you, uh, you guys decided to do this. This, alhamdulillah, at least would shed some light on, you know, for people that later on when they use this argument, you know, as some sort of solid data, there'll be at least a video that's debunking the essence and the base of this whole thing to begin with. Jazakumullah khair. With that, brother, I think I'm going to try to get going. Uh, it's been running for like over an hour. It was definitely an honor and privilege to be a privilege to be with you guys in the same platform. Jazakumullah khair. Okay, yeah, bro. Do nothing inshallah, in we'll, we'll do something in the future, inshallah, brother. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah, come here. No you, you know, so, uh, yeah. I just want to add something about this as well too about the sure. um, about the education again um, they're saying in the bottom that more than half studied a STEM subject so they're trying to say they were in science they were not just some you know contributing fields right um, or, or, or um, you know what we would say yeah. um, uh, reputable fields Again, why what they're trying to do is frame the narrative that the more intellectual, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to leave Islam. And again, the problem with this is we don't know at what point in their journey did, did they leave Islam. Was it before college? Was it yeah. during college? What was it? I mean, what was it after? They, did, did they change their major later on? Or did they exactly. already complete this and then become ex-Muslims? How do we know what the demographics is? And we don't know. I'll, I'll tell you something because most of them are, are immigrants, okay? So these people came from mostly from uh, the, mid the Middle East and, and, and from Africa and from South Asia, right? Uh, the thing is, many, many Muslims in these parts of the world, they do lean towards engineering, computer science, and natural science as well. Like, for example, the medical field. And, and, and so these patterns of, you know, uh, th these preferences towards e education are also uh, found in Muslims living in these parts of the world. So we can't really say uh, when they became interested in, in obtaining, you know, degrees in these fields, before or after. So what you're saying is this is more representative of the culture. Of Muslims, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's, the culture and, the, and the, the geographic location rather than them being ex-Muslims. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so for example, in, in the Indian subcontinent uh, and, and also in, uh, in, 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 uh, lar in, in many parts of the Middle East, you know, it's, it's, it's very preferable, uh, for example, to pursue a degree in the medical field. Like becoming a doctor is the thing, right? Uh, also, if uh, it, you know, being in, being an engineer, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, all all of these fields are are, are uh, preferred in uh, right. in, I mean, in, in Iraq, the world. Syria, Egypt, they all. I mean, they yeah, all yeah. focus on engineering sciences. They are computer science, the, uh, medical field, pharmacology. All of that usually is from these places. So it's a common theme in exactly. in, in the Muslim world to be educated. Why? Because exactly. it's from our religion to be educated. And, and these schools, bro, they require very high grades in high school. So this tells you that there are a lot of competition to 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 you know to to uh, to be admitted to these schools. Sure. I so agree. again, it doesn't. It, this doesn't tell us anything. But like you said, they're trying to portray a narrative that you know we ex-Muslims we we love science and look how educated we are and pursuing STEM careers and you know it, like we we can we, we can see through this. So.
before apostasy, so this tells you, um, th this is the most important section in my opinion, okay? So uh, this is the um, sect that they used to belong to. So 82% of them were Sunni, 11% were Shia, and 7% were, were, were other. So like, for example, Ismaili, you know, I, I'm just guessing, you know, they, I, I don't think that they stated what other includes, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Ismaili, um, for example, uh, what, what I'm not sure if uh, um like, uh, you know no like probably like um new ageism or something like this where they combined Islam yeah, yeah. or it could be um Baha'i for example yeah Baha'i or it could be also um you know there are some uh, weird um just uh, who knows oh Ahmadiyya as well Ahmadiyya too. yeah exactly so maybe from so, them or two let's see. Yeah. So they see here, they, they say here, uh, the remaining 7% belong to some other non-mainstream sect, Ahmadi Sufi. Yeah, so I, I was wrong. So they, 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 they do give an indication what other includes. Yeah. So here's the thing. I don't buy this. Let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. There is a Pew Research uh, study. Mm -hmm. It basically tells you that, um, let, let, me, um, let, me, let, let me try to share it uh, here. Uh, give me one second. Yeah. Um, yeah, so while, while you're doing that, um, yeah. we also know that, um, again, this is limited to those 551 from the ex American North, North American ex Muslim Council, which is not an accurate representation. 551 out of I mean, you're claiming millions upon millions are leaving Islam, but you could only find 551 people. Take a survey. It must tell you something. Yeah. Should... So uh, this is a Pew Research study. So it basically says the share of ex-Muslims who leave Islam is offset by those who become Muslim. So this is in the U.S., right? Yeah. Uh, but it says also, uh, but unlike other faiths, Islam gains about as many converts as it loses. Alhamdulillah. Right. So uh, you know, this reminds me of the verse. Uh, uh, that we. Uh, it says, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, if you abandon your faith, Allah will replace you by those who love Allah and those who are loved by Allah as well. SubhanAllah. But here's the interesting part. If you scroll down, there is a very interesting part about Iran. Okay, uh, let me try to find it. Here we go. So check this part out. One striking difference between former uh, Muslims and those who have always been Muslim is in the sheer who hail from Iran. Those who have left Islam are more likely to be immigrants from Iran, 22%, than those who have not switched face. The larger number of Iranian American former Muslims is the result of a spike in immigration from Iran following the Iranian revolution of 1978 and 1979, which included many secular Iranians seeking politi uh, political refuge from the new theocratic regime. Okay, so here's here's why uh, I showed you this. They say 22% of them, of these ex-Muslims, are from Iran, okay? So we should see at least 22% Shia. You get my point? However, the percentage of, of, of Shia uh, survey is only 11%. So it's like mm -hmm. half of the minimum that we should expect. Because as you know, Shia are not only in Iran. Shia are, for example, in Bahrain. Uh, I think I think more more than India, half in Bahrain are Shia. Also exactly, too. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. So it's like there's uh, there are a lot of Shia missing in the, for, you know, in this uh, in this survey. I'm not sure if this is on purpose, because like you know, like we read before, the participants were selected, were handpicked, right? So I'm not sure if this has to do uh, if this has anything to do with it or not. Mm -hmm. But it was an interesting discrepancy. Yeah, it could and I would be, trust. I would trust pure research over them, by the way. Yes, I would trust pure research yeah, over too. them, mm -hmm. and and they and they cite pure research. Uh, by the way, if you if you noticed, they yeah. they they say okay, this percentage that we uh that we um that that, that our results show it's also it's also in line with uh, other pure research studies. So it's like you guys are you know this this, this is not in line with pure research. Yeah. They're very selective of how they ap uh, apply what is in line with Pew Research. But what we can draw from this is that 
they do believe that Pew Research is something to be considered as a standard. So why is it yeah. that this data is not aligning with Pew Research? Well, that shows that you're inherently showing that you have a problem with your research. Um, or or you are skewing the data the way that you want to, right? Um, and also, again, this is going to go back to the main factor that 551 from, from among the North American ex-Muslim Council, who are some of the most hateful um, Islamophobes out there. They will mock Muslims. Some of them have even been uh, caught mocking uh, Muslims dying in the Christ church, right? I mean, this is nothing yep. new. So again, the point being is that these people are not even an accurate cross-section of ex-Muslims. I would argue that they don't even represent the majority of them. I believe that there are certain ex-Muslims out there who don't believe uh, the way they do and don't even uh, spend their time worrying about Muslims or, 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 or you know, trying to even bother. They just go on and live their life. So I would argue that they're actually doing a disservice to people who actually leave <laughs> Islam. Exactly. Exactly. So um, let's go back. Okay. To the uh, study. Add it to the stream. There we go. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So pre Pew Research estimates Sunnis comprise eighty-seven to ninety percent of global Muslim population, while Shias uh, comprise ten to thirteen percent. Okay. So I think this is a little bit deceptive. This is a little bit deceptive because why would you assume that the percentage of Shia ex-Muslims is proportional to the percentage of Shia Muslims. But wh why would you assume this? Right. Do you I mean, get my point? They're, they're not the same in, in terms of disbelief and belief as well. Just because they're the same exactly. in representation, that would not be a representation exactly. for us, right? Absolutely. And, 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 here's, and here's the interesting part. There is a study that tells you, there's a pure re research study that tells you the percentage of uh, you know ex-Muslims from Iran. So why didn't you mention this in your survey? Yeah, it's like absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. It's very misleading. Yep. So uh, the faith and future apostates. How devout were they? Okay, to God, whether uh, respondents were before their apostasy unusually engaged or disengaged in the faith relative to their environment. Okay, relative to the, their environment. So, right. for example, if I say I was much less devout, and you say you were much less devout, that doesn't mean that we were our devoutness were equal. Because, like for example, right. my parents could be less devout than your parents. So, for your example, friends, yeah. For example, yeah. say um, my uh, family. Uh, I didn't eat pork, but my family ate pork. Right, that would mean I'm more. De my family is less devout than my family, right? Or, or than me. Or, for example, let's say I uh, ate pork and my family didn't. Does that mean my family is more devout than me? No, they're not really. Dev I mean, it's not about devoutness. I mean, people have their own issues. When we look at Islam and Iman, and I mean, in generally in Islam, we look at how much um, they're doing in terms of uh, practicing the religion, like not just avoiding one or two things. It's, it's, it's entirety. It's not just based on certain things and subjective opinions. So, for example, exactly. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, no, I was just confirming what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just it's a very weird way to understand this right and say what is the, the the determining factor over whether somebody is devout religious not religious medium you know semi-practicing how do you define these things because if you are an ex-muslim most likely you don't understand what is what would make somebody quote-unquote religious because to be honest these ideas of devout and undevout the, these are things that muslims themselves don't use we don't come out and say hey salamu alaikum I'm, I'm a devout muslim by the way no, nobody says this nobody says i'm an i'm a i'm not a devout muslim Right, these are not things that we we talk about because in Islam we have a concept of the fact that you know um, that things are the true intentions are in the heart, and Allah knows who is who has taqwa and who doesn't. We don't know these things. We we don't go on adv advocating these things. So the very idea that you could somehow compare and be like, oh, you know, yes, I think my family was more devout than me, more religious, or maybe I think I was more re religious than my family because my family was cultural. I, I, I had a beard. You know what I mean? What does that mean? Like, what, what, yeah. How does that even mean anything in this, in, in this exactly. study? And the thing is that Islam is well-defined. The, 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 the non-rituals of Islam are, are well-defined. So, for example, praying five times a day, fasting in Ramadan, giving your zakah, right? And, uh, you know, hajj. Right, uh, so like you got four things. They could have said, 
right? You're devout if you do these four things. You pray five times a day at least. You you, you fast in Ramadan. You give your zakah and you do Hajj. But, but most of them are young anyway, so I don't think Hajj even applies. So like you got only three things. You could have put that as a criteria of devoutness. Right. right? It was it, it was right. very simple. But as you can see, for example, here on on the right, they say how often did did, did they pray? Okay, not at all. When forced, okay. Sometimes, what what does sometimes mean? Like two times a day, three times? I I don't know. Did you only pray Juma? Whenever possible. I don't know whatever. What does what does that even mean? It's meaningless. All the time. Yeah. So, so all the time could mean five times a day. Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, uh, yeah. just off just off the bat, I don't trust the data. Um, like I said, there are people who are vehemently opposed to Islam. And they may say, yes, I prayed all the time. Um, and, and to be honest, and it's a fair question. One might say, well, because I'm going to make another statement after this. And they're going to say, well, how can you make that statement if you don't trust the data? Well, th the reason being is because um, I'm going to you know, just approach it from different angles. But let's just say 21% all the time. I guarantee you, many of them didn't even know what the fixed times of prayers were. How do I know whether you pray three times a day or five times? What was your definition of prayer? Again, because they're compiling all of these uh, ex-Muslims, even that 3% that were in some odd, weird sect that may have been like their version of praying is going to uh, the what they call um, Jamaat Khana in, in like the, um, the Aga Khanis once a week. Is that yeah, and uh, Ismailis, by the way, they don't pray uh, five times a day, I think. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing. This is what I'm saying. So this data is entirely skewed. How do we know what it, which demographics? Uh, if they were honest, there was an of the Sunni, this percentage prayed, to, you know, the X amount of percentage. Uh, of, I mean, five times a day. Of the Shia, this is of the of the non-denominational or other. This how much, right? But they, they they didn't divide it. But nonetheless, let's say we accept it. My second argument. Let's say we accept this whole flow chart. I mean, whatever this is. That means that overwhelmingly, eighty <laughs> percent were not practicing Muslims. Right, so when you say how much they were devout, just look at the um, the number of people who claim to be devout later on. You'll see it doesn't match up. Eighty percent were saying they didn't have, not, they were not devout Muslims, right? Because whenever possible could mean whenever I wasn't ashamed, whenever I remembered, whenever if I was at work, if I had time to pray, if the, if the, whatever. It doesn't even mean anything, right? I mean, it's just it's the same as in in our understanding as someone who prays when it's convenient. And that is not someone who has, who, who believes, I mean, who has taqwa, right? I mean, they're not really like practicing as people, I mean, they're not keeping the basics of Islam. So again, 80% of them did not have, did, do, do the most basic, fundamental, the most important thing within Islam. Exactly. 80% of them did not pray five times a day. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we, we should keep this in mind. Um, and let's, just uh, the yeah, thing is, what you there are Muslims today, by the way, I'm not saying every single Muslim prays five times a day. There are people who struggle with prayer, but they don't leave Islam. So th this really data does not really tell us much besides that, besides the fact that, you know, they have other influences besides that. There are people who struggle with religion um, and, and, and they don't they don't leave Islam. Right. I mean, they, they, they realize I have to be better. And so they, they work on their prayer. Right. These are people who had no intention to work on their prayer because you can see that. Um, majority of them were much less, uh, you know, uh, uh, religious than their families were, whatever or devout, whatever that means. So they had no intention of actually correcting this. So again, what I'm trying to tell you is that you can, you can. I mean, if they're trying to say that, you know, Muslims who didn't um, pray are more likely to leave Islam, right? If that's what they're saying, yes, we can agree to a certain uh, extent. But at the end of the day, we've also heard of people that have not prayed or not been regular in prayer that eventually correct themselves, right? And they come back to Islam and they pray regularly. So this is not going to tell us anything besides a limited scope of those 551 people that felt this way. And whatever their religiosity means to them, we don't know. But based on that, this is what we're, the data that we're getting. It's just not qualified. We don't know how to use it. Yep, definitely. Because, and, and again, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm... You know, I'm infuriated by the chart on the uh, on the left here because it basically says I was as devout as my environment. Like, Im imagine if I ask you, Mort, how devout are you? And then you respond by saying, oh, I was as devout as my environment. I will, or I was much less devout as my environment. The, you, you, you're not right. telling me anything. Right. Right. Because it's what is your environment? Did your father a sheikh? What, was you, did you grow up in a Muslim country? <laughs> did you have, I mean, what, what's your environment? Was your father a shaitan? And what was the issue? 
I mean, how do we know? Exactly. We don't know. Exactly. It's such a wide spectrum. Yep. So uh, here, in engagement in prohibited activities. Oh, That's, uh, this is a very, <laughs> very interesting section here. So yeah. in order to explore whether they had uh, possessed long-standing difficulties with Islamic restrictions, okay, respondents were asked about how often they had engaged in various haram or prohibited activities before their apostasy. Okay, so uh, here on the left, there are basically, um, um, you know, uh, talking about alcohol. So percentage who engaged in uh, alcohol consumption uh, and also premarital uh, sexual activity and pork consumption before apostatizing. All right. So when it comes to alcohol consumption, 31% of them said we drank alcohol all the time before we apostatized. So when yeah. they were Muslim, 31% of them were drinking alcohol all the time. Okay, 70% or, yeah, 70% were sometimes um, when forced, I'm not sure what, what any, who's forcing them to drink so alcohol. I, I think what they meant is peer pressure. Like maybe work or like, you know, being toasted or but, maybe maybe their cat or friends or maybe their family members, maybe they were hiding, their, maybe these but were. If that's the case, I'm wondering why they didn't put peer pressure. Because that would have been oh, well, uh, a more maybe, descriptive. Uh, well, let me give label, them the benefit yeah. of a doubt. Let's just say maybe they were they became Muslims and they were hiding their Islam from their family and let's say the Jewish Shabbat a Shabbat dinner and they had to have wine, something like this. You know what I mean? Maybe they were forced in that way. I don't know what that means, but I think it means culturally forced, not physically yeah. forced to have it. But what's interesting is what the hell does as possible mean? Like all the time and ask, it, well, what does that mean? Like for example, if, if, if they're on the job, so that would, you know, that would, that would include, uh, it's not possible for me to drink alcohol when I'm, you know, but if they're at home, then, then, then so that would be. So every, no, but then all the time, I'm, I'm assuming the people said all the time meant that, they, I mean, they were not drinking on the job. I mean, I think that's possible. <laughs> we probably, don't know. We don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Unless, I mean. <laughs> I, maybe I think you meant to say as much as possible, meaning that, you know, if they were outside of, of, of you know, the normal work areas, whatever, if they were maybe yeah. with, living with family, maybe they went out to a party and drank as much as they could if they went out partying or something like that. I don't know. But yeah. But, but here's, here's the interesting thing to take from this. 53% of them drank alcohol before they became ex-Muslims. Yeah. They were Muslims, right? 53% of them were drinking alcohol. Yeah. All right. So that's mm -hmm. that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, when it comes to when it comes to premarital premarital sexual activity, it's even crazier because as, as you see here, uh, forty three percent said never. We never engaged in uh, premarital sex when we were uh, Muslims, which which means which means that fifty seven fifty seven fifty seven percent of them mm -hmm. were engaging in premarital sex. Yeah. Absolutely. And they were Muslims. Yeah, 50, fifty-seven percent of them were doing zina, and fifty-three percent of them were drinking alcohol when they were Muslim, which yeah. kind of gives you a real idea of their devoutness, because yeah. the garbage that we that, that we saw here was meaningless. To if, to me, that's meaningless. How how much uh, the, the how how devout were you compared to your environment? That's meaningless. This right. here is much more meaningful to me. Right? right. So, because zina is like uh, a major, a major sin. Mm -hmm. Drinking alcohol is very severe. I think I'm not sure if it's a major sin or not. To be honest with you, I, I forgot. Uh, it's not about, but, but I mean, it's not kufr, but, but still, I mean, if yeah. you if you accept that it is allowed, then it becomes. I mean, if you say this, it's not haram, then of course it's kufr. Yeah. But if you, but none, none, nonetheless, it, it's one of those sins that lead and open the doors to other major sins. So it's still an evil vice. Yeah. And poor consumption was uh, like a no-no for <laughs> for these ex-Muslims. Like, mashallah. Yeah, yeah, look at the so religious, they're so devout. They didn't eat pork, mashallah. Yani, alcohol yeah. and zina are okay. But yeah. Pork, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> we can't tolerate this. <laughs> so this, you know, from this, what I'm understanding is that, to be honest, they were just cultural Muslims. Because if you if you if you weren't culturally Muslim, why would you stay away from pork? Exactly. It's right? like you 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 never yeah yeah your parents never brought you uh, pork. From yeah. the supermarket and they, they always uh you know in in gatherings and parties they they, they usually stayed away from pork and yeah. you you basically copied them and that's mm -hmm. how we were brought up and also the problem with this data also they should have 
um, split it up by age because what you want a 16 year old to be having regular sex all the time or drinking alcohol. I mean, I don't understand like what, 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 what how are we divide? I mean, how is this important? I mean, the, the data doesn't apply the same for all these groups, right? Because a 16 year old can't certainly drink alcohol, right? How does an 18, I mean, they're not legal. I think, I think the minimum, uh, the minimum age, uh, let, let, let's go back to uh, age. So the minimum age was 18. Okay, okay, so all these people were 18 or older. They still can't drink alcohol. At 21, you have to drink alcohol. So, I mean, again, this is not... Represented. Really? So it's, so it's not 18? The, the no, no, minimum no, age no. of drinking is not 18? Not in America. It's maybe 18 in Canada, but in America, 21. Oh. Yeah, so an another problem. That's with interesting. Study. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that is an issue, right? They're not accurately representing. They're trying to lump some all of this data among all age groups, categories, demographics, and that's the problem. They're trying to skew it in their favor. Um, but also just to quickly mention, um, Halabi, that premarital sexual activity doesn't always mean uh, fornication. It could mean like, you know, um, kissing or um, yeah. fondling or whatever else they do. But the idea is that they were engaging in haram, right? And here's the other thing too. And I hate to be, you know, I hate to be uh, the bearer of bad news here, but 43%, how do we know it's, uh, it's by voluntary? Like they, it was not involuntary, meaning... I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is, how do we know that they didn't, They maybe they tried and they couldn't find anybody to have sex with, right? A premarital activity, right? I mean, how do we know these things, right? Or what percent um, did they did they um, exclude anybody in there for, um, for just as, as a data, I mean, looking at it from a perspective, um, is there any exclusion for rape or molestation, right? I mean, did, did they lump that together inside the categories? I mean, I don't know, right? right. Would, would they call that engaging in sexual activity? Because ah, man, technically, you someone know. being raped is not engaging, you know. With these people, you don't know. What is it? I mean, again, these, these are the same people that prey on young children in their group. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So on on the right here, this section has to do with uh, women and modesty. So uh, as another potential uh, uh, gauge of religio religiosity and practice female uh, respondents were asked about the extent to their adherence to some clothing requirements before they apostatize. All right, so 20% said they did not comply with clothing requirements. All right, 5% said merely avoided Western swimsuits. What kind of question? <laughs> <laughs> like, Again, it's meaningless. Like, like, like that's okay. the most important dressing thing, like bathing suits. How often do we, are we in the pool 24 hours a day? Yeah, what's wrong with these people? They're it's so like, stupid. okay, so, so, okay, so you, you avoid swimsuits, but you, you, you were, you, you were topless in the street. With it. So it doesn't mean anything. You, yeah. you, you could, you could have avoided swimsuits, but I, I don't know what, <sighs> subhanAllah. Covered hair, legs, arms, 27%. Covered okay, so like, that hair, just a legs and arm. Okay, the, so the hair and body. Yeah, covered hair, uh, covered their hair and body, forty-one percent. Covered their face, hair, body, four percent. Other three percent. What, what does other mean? I don't know. Let's see. Only four percent said they uh, worn face coverings. Okay, but other the, the they didn't say what other includes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I don't know what other. Yeah. Maybe they were. I don't know. Maybe. They, but but, but the is that this is what yeah. I want to say. Covered their hair and body, right? Hair body. First of all, um, <laughs> what what if she's she was wearing like, like uh, yeah exactly or for example tight uh, or tight clothes exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, tight clothes ah, or see through like cover your hair what does that even or mean or see through. See like they, they were, they, they could have worn see-through. Oh, we, we don't know. No, not not, not only that. Um, we know, unfortunately, there are some sisters who think they're wearing hijab, but they're not. Like they have a convertible, yeah. right? Like they're showing your hair. It's just kind of cultural, you know. It's just yeah. like whatever. I'm sorry, but again, this is if the data is true. And by the way, um, this really means nothing to us. Whether they're modest or whatever they do, again. Um, mo and, and I'll tell you why this is really doesn't mean anything. And this is why it's funny, especially in terms of this data, because this is taken from the North American Ex-Muslims Council, right? And 
there's no way a family could force a woman to wear hijab in this country, right? The minute she goes outside, she can do what she wants to do. And there are girls who do that, right, who are forced at home. When they go outside in school, they simply just take off the hijab in the school bus, whatever, and, you know, do whatever they do. So there's no way you can force someone to wear hijab, right? So the idea yeah. here is that, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it just you know, um, the whole notion behind this is that, that 41% covered their body and their hair. And so now they, you know, they took it off for after Islam and that they're, they're, they're trying to paint a narrative. That's what they're trying to yeah. do. And the thing to take away from this is that 52% of them did not wear proper Islamic clothing. Because if you add 20 to five to 27, you get, fi you, mm -hmm. you get 52. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming that covered uh, their hair and body proper and hijab. It, right yeah it was it was proper hijab so yeah. again 52 percent of them did not 52 percent of women did not wear proper Islamic clothing 53 percent of them were drinking alcohol and 57 percent of them were engaging in premarital sexual activity yeah and actually so, i would uh, say these numbers are higher but they're just trying to curb them down because they don't want them to uh be i agree because because not them not being straightforward with how many respondents actually uh, are included in this survey tells me that there's something going on here mm -hmm. yeah yeah and absolutely and, and i'll be honest with you we have own independent research done from muslim organizations that would tell you that the alcohol consumption in people in college is much higher right now 70 percent rate so what I'm yeah. saying is that even their data is not matching up with even the data that Muslims are saying. So maybe they're skewing the data because they don't want to make it sound like they're a bunch of drunks, right? And a bunch of, you know, horny, horny guys running around doing whatever, or girls and guys doing it, right? So again, I don't trust the data. I don't trust it. And yeah. I'll be honest, I, we're just reading through this just because we want to just kind of go through it a little bit. But I don't trust this for one bit. I don't trust the people writing it. I don't trust their intentions. I don't trust it. I mean everything's dodgy about even how they got the 551 you know how they're compiling the data what demographics they're using how they're lumping people together i don't trust any of it i'm sorry i can yeah. just just like you are skewing the data and interpreting it any way you want to i can do the same thing from this from this survey too it's not if you want to i mean two can play that game yep and and by the way about uh, alcohol consumption i mean uh, some of them were actually proud about this statistic so for example abdullah samir shared the you know, uh, a screenshot of the uh, alcohol chart. And he said, ha ha ha, 50% or whatever of us were drinking alcohol before we became ex-Muslim, ha 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 ha. <laughs> and he was being, yeah, he was like teasing Muslims. Like uh, maybe, maybe that was his uh, solid <laughs> rock man attitude, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so uh, community involvement, and, and this also doesn't make sense uh, in, in, the, in, in light of uh, previous uh, numbers. So it basically tells you, um, you know, um, a percentage of, uh, who participated in uh, social events, mosque uh, attendance, uh, activities uh, of organizations, leadership or, uh, of organizations within their religious community before apostatizing. Okay, so according to this, um, Seventy-two percent of them, um, you know, participated in social events within their religious community before apostatizing. Yeah. Okay. Fifty-three percent of them attended the mosque regular on a regular basis. Hmm. I don't buy this. I, I don't buy this uh, at all. You know why? That means, like, again, what is regular basis? Because again, different communities mean different things. Like, for example, for the Shiites, listen. Well, what if they have some kind of Muta convention every week? How do you know they weren't going for that? Or for the uh, for the um, Ismailis, they have stuff, a potluck for dinners and stuff. What does that even mean? What what does that mean? Regular attendance for what? For salah? For uh, regular attendance for what? Sunday school? For what, what are you attending for? Like what what is the issue here? We don't know. They're not qualified. Yeah. And also remember, remember, fifty two percent of women did not wear proper hijab. Fifty three percent of them were drinking alcohol. Fifty seven percent of them were doing zina. Right, or engaging in sexual activity, premarital sexual activity. However, however, subhanAllah, 53% of them were attending the mosque in a regular basis. Yeah, and they weren't praying by uh, the So how do you know, uh, what, what were they doing? Playing Arbatash and Tarnib inside of uh, the mosque? <laughs> what were they doing? I mean, like, for, if they weren't praying. Doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any sense, bro. Yeah. It, it doesn't make it because, like, for me, attending the mosque regular, uh, in a regular basis means you're basically, you know, you're praying your, your five prayers in the mosque. Or maybe, like, for me, that's what it means. But I think for them, it might mean, like, Salatul Jum'ah, 
maybe meant like this, you know, maybe once a week they went just to go, you know, check people out, have, like, lunch, have lunch. Even after. like if I tell you, yeah, even yeah, once a week is not regular. Uh, but it's not again, again, it, like it's, it's not really, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so it, it, here, here are the comments that they sampled from the respondents, and these are hilarious. Let's let's go through some of them. <laughs> Okay, so respondents were also given the opportunity to elaborate on the degree of their pre-apostasy community involvement and embeddedness in a write-in response. Some notable responses follow, right? So these are no notable responses according to the ex-Muslims of North America, right? So let's see. <laughs> I was an imam. <laughs> I was an imam at, okay. at a small prayer group. Uh, as a teenager, like, a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I ran a Quran club and read Quran at my schools and Mashallah. of year ceremony. Mashallah. Oh. So end of year ceremony, the guy stood up and read some Quran in front of, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that to him, that to him, in, encapsulates what a devout Muslim should be, or should have been. Yeah, you think that you are an imam at a teenager? <laughs> And you wrote the Quran once in front of like a gathering of people. Yeah, yeah, and you're okay. Yeah, we do that. I do that. We, I mean, I, was, I grew up doing that. Who cares? I mean, I mean, we all do this. You know, who cares? Well, I mean, well, <laughs> again, these these comments, these comments are meant to intimidate Muslims. Like, look how devout we we were, you guys. Yeah. And despite all that, we became ex-Muslim. Which, like, you know, if 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 a Lima Muslim reads these comments, you know, his or her faith could. Could, you know, could be shaken by this. Like, for example, they, they, they would think, how how was how is it possible that these devout uh, former Muslims became ex-Muslims? They must they, they must have studied uh, Islam more, and then they found something, you know, uh, wrong with Islam. Then you, you, you get my point, right? It's 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 meant to intimidate Muslims. That's yeah. the, that's the thing, because like I'm sure I'm sure that there were that th 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 there were respondents that, for example, commented saying we well, were not devout uh, i wasn't really into religion i didn't pray five times a day uh you know i stayed away from you know mosque gathering I, I, i'm sure some some of them commented right uh, along these lines but these right. comments were not included they were not sampled yeah okay no, absolutely yeah okay. memorize the quran and let prayers uh, and tarawih it was, <laughs> I was very well known for my religiosity in my community look at it, and it was, it was 19 19 year old yeah. They were 25, of, 25 year old. Uh, yeah. I, a library. I ran a mosque library for years. Mashallah. So, from his yeah. he ran. You know, I mean, just look, <laughs> you know, look, look at this guy. I ran, I was a member of a student Islamic organization. I mean, we all, who, I know I went to school in America. Yeah, MSA is just a, group, a, a cultural club for Muslims when you want to go hang out, do whatever. It's just a place for yeah. nothing religious about it. But it doesn't mean anything. Look at this guy, he's so proud. I partook in the public Shia, uh, Shia rituals in Tehran, like Ashura, <laughs> practices like self flagellation. Also, I visited Shia holy sites like in places like Mashhad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but look at, look at, look at this uh, comment on the uh, upper left here, the blue one. Uh, community volunteer work, ghost writing of three books on fiqh slash Islamic history, mashallah, on fiqh. Three, as if the, the <laughs> ulama, they, they don't like they would put their name on something they didn't write. Really, three <laughs> books of fiqh that you wrote. Yani, what, what are the yeah. names of these books? I mean, I'd like to know. If you're going to be honest, tell me at least what were the and who and who pre-reviewed them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what was the subject matter of this? Of since you are a, a, a like, fiqh, yeah, I mean, you you are. You, I mean, if you can write three books on fiqh, you must be a faqiyah, right? I mean, this is this is not a joke. I mean, you can write, right? Uh, you must. Have, this, what, what are your credentials to write books on fiqh? I'll give you an example. So on Twitter, I, I met someone who, who uh, uh, an ex-Muslim, who basically said I offered books and I gave sermons as as a Muslim. All right. I asked him, okay, so send me screenshots of book covers that you, you that you offered. Here's here's what happened. He authored, he basically wrote like, you know, these small pamphlets about praying and, and siyam and that, that, that are, that, yeah. that, you know, are distributed in, uh, in mosques. Yeah. That, that was it, bro. That was it. Oh my God. He was writing like, like, for example, 10, like 10 page small uh, pamphlets about siyam and uh, the, the virtues of siyam and the virtues of, you know, uh, and they were being passed down in, in you know, in Ramadan. 
that was it. These were the books, the Islamic books that he authored. Yeah. Imagine this. I, I'm reading this comment. I attended a Muslim school for two years. My sister did for like six or seven years. Many other events at the mosque from taking Quran lessons, Taekwondo lessons, and bi weekly potlucks. <laughs> I missed the food. Yeah, what, what, where did you go to? Like a YMCA? Like what? what you, and, and look, if you were a true ex Muslim, I'm sorry to say this, but you, you're going to know how to spell Quran. Right, nobody sells a Quran. Like, I mean, this is just not something that a typical person who grew up around Islam would would type. Yeah, it's you, totally. Islam, you would type Quran, right? I mean, it just wouldn't be like just Quran. I, I don't understand this. Who are you fooling? Anyways, look, look at this woman. I, I started a Sunday school in a city with no Islamic education or Islamic uh, social venue. So, what is what is a Sunday school? What 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 is a Sunday Islamic school? At the church. What, what is it? It's after church and they go there. That's what happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, because I was asking, well, yeah. I, I was I was just thinking, why wasn't it a Joma uh, school? Why yeah, is it Sunday? Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, in America, they do. Have, to be fair, they do have Sunday schools, but it's nothing big. Yeah. I mean, how many students? What What did you start with? No, it says with no Islamic education and no is or Islamic social venue. So, what? I mean, I don't know of a single American city. You must be not in America because I don't know of a single American community, a uh, Muslim American community community that doesn't have uh, some kind of masjid or some kind of learning, you know, social event uh, facility. I just don't understand it. I, I don't know of a single one. But anyways, look at the last one. I was her I was coerced into teaching kids at the weekend <laughs> Islamic school. Mashallah, they forced you and if they they chained you to the to the to the uh, to the desk and made you mudarrat. And this is what happens. How, how is that even possible? How, how can you force someone to teach kids? What, yeah, what, what happened? What, were you captured by Al Qaeda and the, the, and they force you to, to teach their kids? What the? <laughs> very strange, man. These people have very strange comments. Very strange. But again, comments. I I just want to remind the audience, right? It's so obvious that these comments are meant to intimidate Muslims. Okay, that's it, right? All the comments, like one hundred percent of the comments that you see here, right, are along the lines of. Look how devout we were. Look how uh, embedded we were in our faith before we became uh, ex-Muslims. And keep that in mind, the, while yeah. reading this, that seventy percent of them weren't praying. Exactly. <laughs> and and yes, they were, they were opening massages and library yeah. and teaching and writing fiqh books, books and yeah, mashallah, <laughs> and about history and tarikh and mashallah, like you know, yeah. we have, like these wonderful scholars that were in the community, but they weren't praying. And they were drinking. 50, alcohol, yeah, fifty-seven percent of them were engaging in, in zina, and then fifty-three yeah. percent. After you had made dinner, you're writing books on fiqh. Mashallah. I mean, Look, imagine this. Imagine I got a person. Like, what are you writing on? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the fiqh I had to drink alcohol to crack open a beer. Like, what are you writing on? <laughs> Maybe, maybe the maybe the, these ex Muslims were drunk when they wrote this survey. I, I don't know. Like something doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Something Maybe. doesn't make sense, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this, so, yeah, act of apostasy. Mm. So, uh, the the survey finds that respond uh, respondents' reasons for leaving uh, Islam are complex and multi layered. Even so, there are common elements. Most respondents cited concerns over human rights, logical coherence, and scientific validi uh, validity mm -hmm. as factors that motivated uh, a re-examination of their worldview, right? Mm -hmm. How long does it take? Respondents indicated that their apostasy was generally a lengthy process. A majority, 63%, said that it was a matter of years from when they first began to question the faith before they ultimately left. Mm. Um, 30 percent said it was a matter of months 63 said uh, yeah it was a matter of years and seven uh, seven percent said Gosh. it was a matter of days Jesus. like yeah Jesus. these these people are not wasting time you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ended in america and khalas cracked open the beer you know? uh, yeah and, uh, yeah it, it's, it's a good point because these these are immigrants mostly yeah yeah exactly so the years i mean i don't understand what that i mean so i don't know i mean maybe that could be true i mean months and fine fine maybe true I mean, I, I, again, we don't know what were the causes and who they are and what demographics they were, what age they were. I mean, this is just, I mean, again, it's just giving generalized information that we can't really derive much benefit from. Yeah, yeah. And like on top of that, 
you, you, you know, more than 50% of you guys were not practicing right? Uh, you know, at the same time. So was this a result of you questioning your faith? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, look at six or was it? It took for years, right? I and mean, that's roughly among the percentage of people that were drinking and not praying. So, I mean, during those years, I mean, you weren't really, what were you contemplating? I think maybe you just got tired of... Uh, of uh, uh, Guilt, for example. Yeah, yeah. You just said, hey, you know, I, don't, I don't want to claim something, you know I mean? So you weren't really practicing. I don't know. You left Islam long before. You just decided to come out and say it. I mean, if, you, if, if you're not praying and you're, not, and you're drinking and you're fornicating, yeah, I mean, what, what is the... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, what was to decide? It just took you years, maybe because maybe you were staying at home. You wanted to get, you know, you, you didn't want to be kicked out of your house. Maybe you wanted your parents to pay for your school. Maybe you wanted to keep your friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So who knows? Yeah. Like, this is not definitive. It, it doesn't teach us anything. It doesn't give us the um, underlying reasons. Yep. Yeah. Um, age of apostasy. So most 46% of them So look at Yeah. The real quickly, I, I mean, yeah, we can see all, all, all the other numbers, but check this out. 17 to 22, and we already established 26%, that. 26%, yeah. Yeah, but we already established that uh, they believe in science, and science tells you that your prefrontal, I think it's your cortex, doesn't really, you know, your decision exactly, making yeah. Yeah. Is not there until you're 25. So they agree that most of these people left Islam when they were uh, unable to make wise decisions. Much yeah, their hormones are raging. The, you know, it's like uh, they're, they're, they're young adults. Yeah. You're also surrounded with, you know, an environment that engages exploring your sexuality and, uh, you know, engaging in corruption, yeah, exactly. moral degeneracy. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, so yeah, people like Armin Nawabi who tell you it's okay to have sex with your sister. I mean, so what, what do you think? Uh, Apostle Prophet as well. Yeah. So it's, it's like, okay, so am I supposed to believe that these 20, uh, that these 17, 17 to, 20 to, uh, to 22 year olds thought about their faith? contemplated it right uh you know check the scientific validity as they put it and uh, check the logical co coherence and because of all of this they apostatized or they were into girls and they were into boys and 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 they were into drinking and and, and stuff like that they were you know they didn't really want to pray uh yeah. and, and and you know they in they, they said Khalas, i'm gonna i'm gonna leave the faith interesting about well, it, i just realized yeah. Do you know it's interesting 62 percent roughly of these people left islam before the age of 22 right yep 62 right go back to the um the chart on education about degrees yeah so majority of them left islam before they completed their degrees yeah exactly that's a, yeah that's a, that's a good point it's a good point. you know it's it's, a, it's really uh, good that we're <laughs> linking you know pieces of information together they refuse because, themselves if in the narrow yeah, to create i mean because each each piece of information on its own could make sense but if you put it alongside of you know other charts you know you know things begin to break apart yeah yeah absolutely